here. Appreciate the opportunity to discuss my piece. Uh, Rick said I was seated at the far left of the panel, and that's true. <laughs> But some might think that I'm not at the far left of the relevant political <laughs> spectrum on matters of this kind in virtue of the argument that I make in the piece. You all can all grab the magazine and you should spend your precious time tonight reading it carefully. I will not try to summarize what I say in that piece. Uh, I do think, though, a few words about what motivated me to write in the way that I did uh, are appropriate here in my uh, now nine minutes. <laughs> uh, Mike Brown is no Rosa Parks, and he ain't no Emmett Till either. That would be a very pointed way of putting what I'm getting after there. No Rosa Parks in the sense that, in my opinion, as I try to elaborate in my little piece, this is not the occasion to mount, or not the appropriate occasion upon which to mount, or not the appropriate example or foundation upon which to mount a movement aimed at redressing the problems that uh, are serious, uh, and that definitely need to be addressed, and that need to be addressed politically. Uh, I don't see us getting there from here. I try to say why in the piece. No Emmett Till either in the following sense. The, the temptation to draw this analogy, black bodies abused, uh, black lives not mattering throughout American history from the days of slavery through the years and decades of Jim Crow right down into the present day, one seamless elaboration of an ideology of racism and white supremacy that works itself out in the lives of African Americans even as we speak is a mistaken characterization of the actual circumstance that we confront. Okay? The neoliberal order of the early 21st century which has human refuse to deal with, black and white human refuse, people without jobs, without the opportunity to develop their God-given talents and to express them s their full humanity, people who have no futures, who are failed by the schools that serve them, for whom the government has no interest, the talk is all about a middle class and not about the poor, that is not Jim Crow. And the extent to which there is a racial disparity in the suffering that this failure of our political economic order has produced to the extent that there is a racial disparity, yeah, that is to a great degree a legacy of our racial history. But in my humble opinion, it will not be effectively addressed by characterizing the problem as racism 101, racism American style, and so forth and so on. We need to get down on the ground. On the ground, it's complicated. On the ground, yes, police are running amok. Yes, warrior cops are strutting their stuff up and down American avenues. And they're picking out black people and they're picking on black people. And it's a crime, it's a shame, it's against their constitutional rights, our constitutional rights, and it should be protested. But it's not gonna solve the problem of the failed schools. It's not gonna solve the problem of an economy that has no place for anybody. It's not gonna solve the problem of urban space that's organized in a racially segregated way because it suits the interest of the people with power who live in these places. If we want to remove the structural impediments to the full expression of African American humanity, we need a broad-based, non-racial political movement that aims at the foundations of our political economy. That's the position that I've taken. Um, so this is not the movement that's going to get that done. He's no Rosa Parks. He's no Emmett Till either. The depredations of racist police officers in American cities, such as they are, comes nowhere close to being state-sanctioned violence of the kind that you saw throughout this country not that long ago. It is a disservice and to some degree a disrespect I'm maintaining of that legacy now overcome of state-sanctioned violence, such as one saw elaborated at uh, Bloody Sunday on uh, Edmund uh, Pettus Bridge back in uh, Selma, Alabama in, in 1965. It is to some degree a disrespect of that tradition to latch on to, if you will, even to cherry pick a relatively few cases. They are egregious and they should be objected to. And then characterize that as playing out in the 21st century what we've always known, black bodies don't matter and so forth and so on. I get why that works with sophomores. I don't get why it works with serious people. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Rick. Thank the Watson Institute and thank my colleagues near and far. Um, 
I have to beg to differ, honestly, with both presentations. <laughs> uh, so we'll just keep it uh, as, as sharp as I can, because I have a lot to say. Um, let me look now before I go into a haze of argument <laughs> and lose track of time. Um, first, um, I'm profoundly disturbed by the facile use of Rosa Parks and Emmett Till um, in a context in which we're expected to feel comfortable judging the fundamental character and morality of individuals as the basis upon which we should then choose to develop a movement for social justice. It's a ridiculous idea that people have had to make political calculations to do. Rosa Parks was chosen over other young women who were going to take her place because they became pregnant. There were two actual women in that situation. And that it was a, a feared that a young woman with a baby couldn't stand the scrutiny of the moral exceptionalism that black people are forced to live up to, that everyone else escapes. Um, and that they had to find the perfect woman, the perfect black person, the, the wonderful individual who does nothing wrong, who doesn't erupt in rage at systemic racism, that doesn't do anything terrible, so that we can prove to white people that structural racism is happening. Can somebody explain to me how insane that is? <laughs> now, does that mean I think I should want to defend Mike Brown's possible stealing of a cigar? No, but I can describe my Dalton prep school experience with white children and the criminal activities they engaged in all the time that not only went unmarked, but if it got marked, imagine how many exceptional explain. Oh, you know, his dad's never around. He's traveling off, you know, in the bowels of capitalism. He just doesn't have time to raise him properly. And what did we get? Yeah, he needs help. He needs assistance. He needs some care and love. Put the cigars back, John. Come on, John. But when it's Mike, he becomes the proverbial thug. Now, let me, let me engage with the theoretical framework of the piece, because the piece itself, I think, does something much more pernicious than is available on the surface. Um, the written piece sets up um, three central um, oppositions, three central extreme oppositions. Um, they are individual versus community responsibility, pigs versus thugs, and gentle giant versus public menace. And these three strategies, um, uh, these three, I'm sorry, these three oppositions um, frame the ideological logic of the piece. And I want to back us up from this and ask who frames stories this way and why? And I want to make an argument that the use of this and one other strategy that I'm going to unpack in a moment r mirror corporate media's way of framing mm -hmm. arguments to produce extreme oppositional thinking absolutism, and a kind of sense that these kinds of claims are fundamentally both equally irrational and the truth lies at some fictitious middle. And why that matters so much is because in that middle is status quo. In that middle is the life we're leading right now, a life structured in extraordinary structural violence against black people. It is by no means a seamless elaboration of history. It is actually a very complex, transforming uh, kind of elaboration. That is to say, it's very different now than it was. And Jim Crow was not a national phenomenon. It was a regional phenomenon. But slavery was also a regional phenomenon with national consequences. We have many different formations over the past 350 years. It's not seamless. But if we do not attend to the very clear ways in which the elaboration retains a fundamental set of principles, then we get lost. So let me give you a clear example of how this is not Jim Crow. During Jim Crow, you had explicit laws that were intentionally designed to language black people as non-human, less than human, less valuable, less important structurally, and not able to access citizenship and any equal rights. It was very clear. It was very explicit. But that was a mechanism for something bigger. And this is where the continuity remains. That was a mechanism for what would then have been called white power or white supremacy in that context, which is the control of resources, the control of space, and the creation of a social world based on race and racial privilege. So the question is, well, how do you get to that kind of outcome after the civil rights movement? 
You want to create that outcome? You can't create laws that say black people can't vote, black people can't have the same resources in school, black people can't fill in the blank. You create structural racism, a language of race-neutral language uh, laws that produce economically almost the same effects, socially very similar effects. Yes, we have a larger middle class, I can hear Glenn. Yes, we have a larger middle class, but we have a much more isolated, controlled, and desperate black working class and poor that is not just the product of poverty, but the product of structural racism in relationship to the evisceration of resources in black communities. So it's not just poverty in the abstract. It's why you see very different formations of community among black poor and other groups of people who are poor. So structural racism, for those who don't follow this field at all, um, the very simple definition is the normalized, that's very important because it's not exceptional, it's normalized, and legitimized range of policies, practices, and attitudes. So it's belief, policy, and practices that routinely, not exceptionally, produce cumulative and chronic adverse outcomes for people of color, especially black people, and it's the main driver of racial inequality and racial discrimination in America today. So this extremist speech that the media uses to create this oppositional language of individual versus community, pigs versus thugs, gentle giant versus public menace, obscures structural racism entirely. It forces our attention to imagine that Darren Wilson has to be either a, has to be a pig or a great cop, or Mike Brown has to be a thug or a complete perfect victim. The media is deeply invested in these fictions because they obscure the structural forces that are at play. We don't need to talk about Mike Brown on his own. We could very easily talk about the hundreds of cases and all of those who have not been killed but simply harassed. The statistics that New York City has elaborated, and I'm sorry, has uh, um, offered around stop and frisk suggest that all young black and Latino men in New York have been stopped at least two to three times. In order for the numbers of stops and frisks for that age and race group to be true, people would have been, had to have been multiply stopped and frisked. This is rendered invisible by pig and thug. This is rendered invisible by individual versus personal responsibility for behavior. This is obscured by gentle, gentle giant versus public menace. So these trio of extremist positions about crime, about punishment, about character, about responsibility, in this framework, they stand outside of history, power, and ideology. They, in fact, stand outside of the context that create the very categories themselves. Thugs are not race neutral figures. Thugs are a racial dog whistle. That is the purpose of the term, to use it as a neutral oppositional phrase that is not designed actually to dehumanize a constituency who has long been dehumanized is, it seems to me, historically inaccurate and politically a little bit dishonest. The second media strategy is the disaggregation of the story. So what does the media do? Whenever these cases happen, we go deep down into what kind of person, what was he doing, what was she doing, where were they? We get all involved in what I call the patent place of false you know, news reporting. You know, we get immediately, over and over, despite the continuities of circumstances, despite the evidence that explains structurally what has happened in, in not just policing, but in all of the facets of structural racism, we somehow can't tell that story. We can't tell the story of how housing, criminal justice, joblessness, underemployment, incredible, staggering wealth gap based on race, incredibly troubled schools work in concert with one another to produce an interlocking system that renders working class, not just extremely poor, but working class and poor black people as a whole, despite exceptions, absolutely uniquely and specifically destroyed as a community. That is not a question on the table, in far, as far as I'm concerned. There's enormous elaborate evidence for this. But what becomes visible with disaggregation? Did Mike Brown try to steal a cigar? Was Darren Wilson legitimate in shooting him however many times? You know, is it good to sell Lucy's? You know, breaking the law is a bad thing. We end up in a ridiculous conversation about Lucy's. 
that is a reference not to Mike Brown, but to Eric Garner and the case of his situation in, St in Staten Island. So this kind of uh, disaggregation of the, uh, of the story into a micro-focus personalizes systemic forces. It robs us of our intelligence. It asks us to equate our comfort zone with a racial justice project. And it actually suggests that if you're comfortable, you should be comfortable. Because these are just the details of exceptionalism. These are the details that allow us to remain reasonable from a comfortable place, not outright, not outraged, not despairing, not with an extreme level of emotional empathy, and not with a recognition that, you know what? We did not actually fundamentally transform the racial relationships and dynamics in this country. We transformed the mechanisms through which certain structures continue to operate. And so I would like to say in conclusion, there is absolutely no uh, 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 disagreement on the question of getting on the ground. It's the one phrase I will end on a, a moment, a brief moment of agreement. Yes, we need to get on the ground. And what that ground is, is outside of media narrative, it means talking to organizers, knowing that Mike Brown is not the linchpin to a movement. He's one spark among many. And anybody involved in the criminal justice activism, which I'm sure Glenn Loughton knows quite a bit about, would know that he's one of hundreds and hundreds of people and many, many local movements all over the ground, multiracial, inflected by race, not limited to the category of race, but transforming the identity of whiteness so that a social justice movement is not a project of racial polarization. Thank you.